Welcome everybody back from lunch and thanks for coming to the session today on lessons learned from Bluebird Bio and their recent ICER assessment earlier this year. My name is Brent Rice and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Autolus. For those of you that don't know Autolus, we're a clinical stage development company and we're developing T-cell program therapies uh, for hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. We have over 100 patent families, and our lead asset is for relapsed refractory adult ALL. I'm going to be moderating this session today with Clark. And before we get started, I want to give Clark the opportunity to introduce himself in Bluebird Bio. Thanks, Brett. So yes, I'm Clark Paramore. Um, I've been at Bluebird about six years. I head up the health economics and outcomes research team. We try to generate the evidence to back up the value propositions for our therapies. I um, want to thank ARM for this opportunity. This topic, maybe six years ago, would have had a little bit of a smaller audience in a side room, so it's great to uh, have a chance to talk about this today. I think it's an important topic for a lot of companies um, moving forward in the future. Uh, Bluebird, Bio, Bluebird Bio is focused on severe genetic diseases. We're very lucky to have two of the four FDA-approved therapies. In August, our therapy for beta thalassemia, Zinteglo, <coughs> was approved. And these are individuals um, who receive regular red blood cell transfusions. And then in September, we had an approval for Skysona, which is focused on an ultra-rare dis disease, cerebral adrenoleukodystrophy. Uh, and we also are planning to file or expect to file in Q1 of 2023 for our investigational therapy, gene therapy for sickle cell disease. So I look forward to the discussion today, and we're um, excited that patients have a chance to um, have access to these um, transformative therapies. Absolutely. Thanks, Clark. Yeah, we're going to spend about the next uh, 27 minutes trying to unpack the experience that Clark has gone through with, with ICER. But to start that, just to establish a baseline for the room, I'm sure not everybody is familiar with ICER. Clark's just going to provide a brief background on who ICER is and what they do. All right. So ICER stands for the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. They're a nonprofit, independent research organization that's been around since around 2013. They did make some national attention around 2014. They examined cephalidae for hepatitis C, and it was an interesting uh, therapeutic area because it was a, rel a relatively high prevalent disease with a high cost therapy, which had not necessarily happened before in the U.S. setting. So it got a lot of national attention, and ICER kind of came out and discussed more the budget impact and the, the overall financial impact of such a therapy, even though they deemed the therapy to be cost effective. So that, they kind of got some national attention that way. They typically try to time their assessments when the product is, is, is expected to be approved by the FDA, and so that, that's typically their timing. Um, they look at both the clinical benefit as well as what they view as the value for money uh, for the products. And uh, the reason we're discussing um, Bluebird today is uh, earlier this year, um, roughly summertime, they put out their assessment for Zinteglo for beta thalassemia. Yeah, thanks, Clark. So maybe you, just to piggyback on that. Yep. Maybe you can walk us through the assess uh, assessment process that you yep. went through with ICER and what that involved. All right. So roughly October of last year, ICER sent a, a note to us, a direct note to Bluebird saying we, we are planning to announce publicly that we're going to assess uh, Betty Cell at the time, now Zinteglo. And it's roughly an eight to ten month process. As, as I said, it's summer of this past, um, this past summer is when they finalized their assessment. It's a very rigorous process. They will lay out a scope of work, a scope of research, how they're going to plan to assess you. What are the comparators going to be? What's the population of interest? Um, it's a lifetime model. ICER focuses on what is the expected lifetime impact of a therapy. So there's lots of assumptions and inputs and kind of what we call economic modeling techniques that allow you to try to estimate a lifetime impact of a therapy. Um, they will have a modeling meeting where they meet with you and say, what have you done to date about this disease area? What can you tell us about any modeling that you've done? Who are the therapeutic experts? Who are the, in our case, transplanters and hematologists that we can speak to? They, they do give a, the company, the manufacturer, an opportunity to provide those names. As important, who are the patients that you have dealt with, if you're a manufacturer, the patient advocacy groups, so that ICER can try to reach out to those individuals as well. Then as you move along, they actually do a public um, draft scope. So they'll submit this out to the public for comment. And uh, Bluebird, we can respond to that in public. Other companies, other individuals, uh, physicians, anyone has the ability to submit their comments on this. And then ICER 
will then put out kind of a revised scope and say, this is how we're going to assess the therapy. And from that point forward, they start moving ahead with their research team doing the assessment. And so they're going to be doing literature reviews. They're going to ask you, if you're a manufacturer, they're going to ask you for all of your trial data, as much as, as you're willing to give them. They have a, like a three-page detailed request for uh, sample, uh, sample breakdowns, different cuts of the data. Uh, some of these things you, you can just say, we're not able to provide that. But they do try to get as much information as possible on your trial data and any publications associated with, with those trials. Uh, that's about a two or three month process. Um, we had a number of direct emails just come to us say, can you clarify this, can you care? So we were working with their project team throughout the process. I do know, and it's public, it's been in other meetings that other manufacturers, there's been a hesitation, a range of views about how much to interact with ICER, how much was ICER actually listening to what they were, uh, the manufacturer was offering um, as feedback. Um, we, uh, we decided to stick with it. We, we felt they were listening to us, and we'll get into that a little bit on some key issues, and so we stayed with them and, and worked with them throughout the process. They put out a draft report um, in about the April time frame, and we had some further discussions with them, which we'll get into that as well a little bit later, and then they revised that in June, and then there's a public meeting. Um, they have, similar to, it's not, obviously not the same as like an advisory committee with the FDA, but they have, they ask transplanters to come, hematologists, patient groups, uh, the manufacturer gets to, um, in this case it was me, uh, sit at the table, and you really have a roundtable discussion and they present their evidence and you have a chance to kind of defend your case or rebuttal in case you had some issues with their data or their approach. Other people weigh in, they have some public comments, and then they have a committee, a group of individuals who are experts in the field that ICER has chosen, their, their research committee, their review committees and then they vote on certain questions, like is it cost effective? Um, what do you believe about the clinical benefit? Is it, is, it strong, is it a strong data package? Things like that, and it's debated amongst the uh, panel members, and then there's kind of a policy round table at the end, what could this mean for market access? What could this mean for future innovation in cell and gene therapy? Some of those things were discussed. And then after all of that, about a month later, they put out their final report and kind of state what is their view of the clinical evidence, and then what's their view of what a, a kind of a health benchmark price. They don't want to say what the price should be, but they kind of give a range and say a, a health benchmark price for the therapy, according to them. So that's a very high level of the eight to 10 month uh, process. Yeah, that's a very involved process, Clark. So maybe you could walk us through briefly just kind of the key takeaways okay. from the ICER assessment of Zentaglo, and maybe frame up the timing of all of these activities you described, kind of what was the time frame that you, you did this in and how long did it take you to prepare? Yeah, so again, we were throughout their process. Um, are you referring to getting ready for the ICE? Yes. Oh, okay, so yeah, that, that does take us back a while. So um, I was very fortunate to be hired at Bluebird almost two or three, four years in some cases, depending on the initial markets before launch. And the, the um, leadership at Bluebird was very understanding of the need for evidence, value evidence, uh, real world evidence, uh, modeling, economic modeling, they were, they were, they were into it. And they wanted uh, us to try to get ahead of the game because they knew we were one of the first companies, it's obvious, that were kind of ahead of the, ahead of the curve, gonna face these HTAs for the first time, face ICER. So they supported it, they provided funding, and we went out and in the case of thalassemia, uh, did a number of studies, a number of chart review studies, uh, patient survey studies, to try to understand the burden of disease, try to understand cost of care, because we were, in our discussions with payers in, in all the various markets, they really had no clue. It's, it's a rare disease. They really did not have a sense of uh, annual cost of care, what these individuals were going through um, in terms of being uh, tied to the medical care system for these individuals who are getting blood transfusions. So we spent a lot of effort uh, um, getting that information. And then, you know, we published it. We tried to get those publications in advance of the HTA reviews or in advance of ICER. Um, and you do need to put that time in. It takes years. It's, it's four or five years to get those things published and have them ready. In our case, we actually had, had published an economic model of a gene therapy for beta thalassemia, and I, it was a peer-reviewed paper, and ICER, they had to look at it. I mean, it was, it was peer-reviewed, and they asked us a lot of questions about it. It actually guided some of their modeling. They, they were like, yeah, we don't know how to model this area, so this seems to be a good idea. So we were a little bit, you know, happy and lucky. It doesn't always happen that way. They don't, they don't do that with every uh, um, situation with every manufacturer. We, we, were, we were glad that they uh, saw the evidence and listened to us. 
Um, so I'm trying to remember what else is covered so in this question. So it's just the, the key takeaways yeah. of the actual assessment. Yeah, so the actual assessment. So there's two main areas, as I mentioned. There's a clinical benefit, and th they're, they're going to look at your trial package, and they're going to look if there were any other um, systematic lit reviews or any other trial evidence, even if it's from other manufacturers, if there happened to be comparative therapies. In our case, there really wasn't. It was, it was um, Zinteglo versus standard of care, which in the case of beta thalassemia, these individuals are getting blood cell transfusions every two to five weeks, and then they're getting, because when you get blood cell, uh, red blood transfusions, you build up iron in the body, so they have to have iron chelation therapy for their whole life. It, this is just a lifetime of going to the hospital, once every two to five weeks, and then also taking iron chelation therapy to keep the iron from building up in your body. So we were um, focused on trying to provide that evidence, and then they take that clinical evidence, they look at the burden of disease, and they rank, they rank the clinical evidence kind of on two axes. One axis is, what's the incremental impact of the therapy versus standard of care? Is it like a substantial benefit, like ch just changes the paradigm for the disease? Is it incremental and just affects maybe a little bit of symptomatic improvement or something like that, just, just as examples. They rank you on level of impact. Um, and for example, in another assessment, Zolgensma got a really high grade because there was its best supportive care in one of their scenarios versus Zolgensma for SMA, and they got a really high ranking. The other piece of that is then, what's the certainty of the evidence? What's the sample size? How many trials? How long did those trials um, run? Um, how clear was the endpoint? How, how well was it measured? they give you another ranking on the certainty of the evidence. So if it's a big impact and they have high certainty that that's gonna hold in the real world setting and it's gonna actually play out with a larger sample size, you'll get the highest grade, which is like an A. We ended up getting a B plus. The main thing that tempered their um, results for us is we had, like a lot of gene therapies are gonna face, we had seven years maximum follow-up, which we, were, we feel was really good evidence, but they're estimating the lifetime impact of the disease. By nature, no therapy is gonna to come to market with a lifetime of data. And so they believe that that sample size that we had, it's a, it's a rare disease gene therapy trial, as well as having a maximum of seven years, they kind of tempered their grade for us and, and gave us a B-plus rating for that. But moderate, to, moderate certainty of a substantial health benefit was the rough result for that. So that was one piece. The other piece was then the value for money, the cost effectiveness. What's the relative cost of our therapy? They, they had assumed a certain price point just to run their analyses, and then what is the incremental impact of that cost offset versus then the net health benefit, which took into account improvements not only in quality of life, these individuals now, if they're transfusion independent, they're not going to the hospital every two to five weeks, but also improved survival in our case. We were impacting, the therapy was um, extrapolated to impact mortality. So we got kind of both of those in what ICER summarizes as a quality adjusted life year. All of that came about, they ran various scenarios, various scenarios on how much would payers be willing to pay for these therapies, and they set these thresholds. And we were shown to be cost effective up to an estimated price of $3 million. And again, we were very comfortable. It, it, it fit our expectations of what we had hoped they would say based on what we felt were the profound clinical benefits and then also the cost offsets that we offered. Yeah, that sounds like a very successful engagement, Clark. Um, maybe you could just kind of spike out a little bit on how the beneficial aspect of this, or how beneficial did you find this was in engaging with ICER for the assessment of Zintegro? Yeah, so there's kind of three, three things that happened during the assessment that I, I think are good lessons that we were really happy that we had a chance to follow up with ICER. So <clears throat> when they came out with their draft report, they had made an assumption, and, and this has happened in other cases of gene therapies that they've assessed, they've made an assumption on durability. So in our trials, there was no evidence to date, out to seven years, granted, not everyone had reached that point, but no one had lost efficacy. Everyone who reached transfusion independence maintained transfusion independence. So there was no, literally no evidence, no discussions, no patients have mentioned it to their investigators. Our data package that we submitted to ICER, it was transfusion independence. There, there are discussions with experts about potential, what the potential could be, how, how you may lose durability. They had some discussions. and. Uh, with some of the experts in the field. Um, they spoke to some patients about um, potential, what, you know, how are you feeling, uh, what are your expectations for how the therapy is going. And they took that and they said, okay, at year seven, we're going to have 5% of Zintegla patients lose durability. 
And then each additional year after that, year eight, year nine, year 10, another 5%. So by year 15 in their model, you know, almost half of our patients had lost durability. And we were like, okay, that, first of all, scientific, scientific plausibility, if you go talk to any stem cell expert, and we gave them names, and these experts were very glad to speak to ICER, as well as we gave the names of our um, PIs from the trials, and, and these individuals were very happy to write to ICER. We said that durability assumption is just, it's pretty extreme. You know, obviously no one knows until these individuals reach those time points what the durability would be, but you're, you're, why are you picking the worst case scenario as the base case for their report, the, what's gonna make the press and what the price should be? Why are you picking that versus giving the benefit of the doubt, well, let's make, let's make the base case that there's perfect durability and then resolve it after that and do a scenario. So we had it back and forth and ultimately they came down to a very, very small percentage of durability loss in the lifetime of the model. So that we were very happy with that. And we felt, we felt, it's, we felt it's relevant and credible to what we think the, the therapy offers to patients. Um, another one was uh, burden of disease. So we did face a little bit more challenge in Europe with some of the bodies about understanding thalassemia and what a burden it was. And uh, we had a few lessons learned there. And we tried to capture as much evidence <coughs> as possible, real world evidence on what these individuals faced on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And we actually did a study with a smartphone where a patient signed up and they tracked their pain, their fatigue, how much time they were spending on a daily basis tracking things that were thalassemia related, insurance issues, uh, setting up their collation, sub-Q collation if they were on that, uh, going to the hospital, traveling maybe one to two hours to the hospital because the hematologist expert is two hours away. We tracked all of it. And we published the time burden that these individuals faced, as well as um, with thalassemia, if you need a red blood cell transfusion, that, at, at the end of that two weeks or that three to four to five weeks, you're starting, the gas tank's running out. You're having fatigue, you're having pain. You get your next transfusion, things get better. Guess what? Next two to five weeks. It's just, it was an ongoing pattern, but no one had ever, hematologists knew this, but no one had ever published the evidence. We published those results showing clinically meaningful impacts on those uh, burden. Those patients were facing clinical uh, um, reductions, uh, noticeable pain, uh, impact of pain and fatigue. And we tried to make that case. And ICER actually really took to that evidence and went to, they spoke to patient groups about it and got more information about what those individuals were facing. And it was a huge uh, help for us with, with the assessment. And then the last one, as I mentioned earlier, we had published the how do you model this disease? How do you extrapolate a lifetime uh, potential uh, benefit of this therapy with the short-term data? And we had a number of hematologists, a number of iron experts back that model and support us. Um, and we showed it to ICE, we walked them through the model design, what, why our inputs were the way they were, what were the key assumptions, and they, and they took a lot of that evidence as well and, and approach when they did their report and their model. So we felt those were really critical to try to kind of change how they were going about it. Yeah, absolutely. Any other aspects relative to the evidence generation and the approach you took that you think really had an impact? Um, again, I, I think having real cost of care data um, from various markets, obviously, including the U.S., I think uh, some individuals were surprised at kind of how much this, uh, it adds up on it. I think our COO mentioned yesterday, it can be up to $6 million on a lifetime basis. Uh, because of the collation therapy and the ongoing transfusion. So it was a noticeable burden that some of the, some of the stakeholders may not have realized. Um, I think that was a major one. I think that the um, ongoing dialogue that we ensured that they had with the right patient groups, with the right clinicians, uh, so that they, because we've heard prior, we've heard prior ISA reviews that they may have not spoken to the, the best clinical expert that really knew that disease area, and they thought they had the clinical story correct, but they didn't really have it correct. We, we did not want that to happen. So we tried to do our best to ensure that they spoke to the true experts in the space. Oh, that's great, Clark. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. You know, when we, when we look at different global HTA bodies, uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to identify the right types of uh, evidence to generate that will satisfy all of the HTA bodies that you have to interact with. So maybe you could juxtapose your experience with ICER versus what you see in how you approach it with European HTA agencies as well? Yeah, so th that was, um, it was a very interesting case because there are some markets, uh, the UK for example does, they're, they're um, NICE, the, the HTA that evaluates new therapies, they do consider a lifetime 
uh, model. So that, that part itself was good because it's, it's a one-time therapy that we believe has potential lifelong benefits, curative benefits. So <clears throat> that was a little bit more comfortable and in our wheelhouse in terms of uh, at least they got that piece correct. Um, other markets, though, they're looking at short-term comparative clinical effectiveness, let's say Germany, France to an extent. That short-term clinical package is how they're going to kind of examine the robustness of what your of your package, and that can set that can relate to what the price that you may be able to get over the current standard of care prices. So the stronger that short-term clinical package, then the, the better likelihood you may be able to have a better price. But for a one-time treatment, that a lot of that benefit is extended out over time. That's a little bit trickier, and, and it's hard for my space for outcomes research or economics to affect that because that's not really the the focus of what they're looking at. France was doing scenarios where they only wanted to give you 10 years worth of benefit, the, the, dur the durability issue. They would run a lifetime scenario, but they were really focused as well on that shorter term time frame and what's your cost effectiveness if it just cuts off at 10 years. And so that, that's, you know, again, we tried to have arguments and discussions with, that, with them, but, uh, you know, they do have a framework for how they do those things. So there's, there's big variation there. And what I liked about ICER at least ICER does have a framework, it's called the single or short-term therapy framework, where they say, we're going to try to evaluate these one-time or potentially uh, transformational short-term therapies, cell, some of the cell and gene therapies. We're going to evaluate them differently. We're going to do scenarios where we're very optimistic or very uh, pessimistic, and they may overprice it or underprice it in their, in their terminology by doing that, but they're, they're a little bit more willing to be flexible. and handle the trial data a little bit differently and, and kind of give a, give a little bit more than maybe some of the more rigid markets uh, in, in Europe. And I felt in some markets and for some disease areas, remember this is not always the case for every disease area, that in some of the European markets they were really just trying to force you into kind of the old approach and not, not say, really, we kind of have to think about this differently because it is a one-time treatment where those benefits are going to be downstream and, and I, we, you know, we had a lot of discussions year over year to try to change that. I think it's going to take a lot more companies keeping at it and fighting the fight. Some, some companies have had some success with that. But to keep trying to make that point that the, there are key differences here that have to be looked at in terms of things like durability. And to, uh, even things like change from baseline, a lot of these uh, individuals are, are chronic. They've had this disease since they were, it's genetic, since they were, they don't know anything else. This is what they've had. And you say, well, how bad is your life? There's actually a term called disability paradox. I think they're doing great. Hemophilia, there's some hemophilia patients that will score as high on a quality of life survey as maybe, you know, I'm only pointing to us as maybe currently considered healthy individuals. They score just as high. Some of them have then had a transformational therapy and they've gotten interviewed later and they're like, oh my God, if I had known if I could be like this, uh, I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought about my prior situation the same way. But HTAs can't do that. They're like, change from baseline. This is what they scored. This is how they improved after the gene therapy, which in some cases, if you have a one on the quality of life score, you can't go any higher, even if the gene therapy transformed everything. So there's kind of methodological things like that that we can't, if they're not going to be willing to understand those distinctions, there's only so much we can do. And it's just that they haven't put their, they haven't been able to get to grapple with that and think how to handle that from, a, from an HTA analysis perspective. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Uh, when you when you look at the different HTA bodies around the globe, everybody seems to take a little slightly different approach. And I know ARM's been very engaged in this in trying to standardize the type of evidence that the HTA bodies will accept, whether that's in Germany or France or the UK. Very important approach. And I know that those efforts are going to continue this year to help all of the companies and the member companies in this room. Maybe it'd be helpful, I think, for any companies in here that are thinking about or contemplating engaging with ICER around their product, maybe you could give one to two key, key takeaways that you think they should consider or, or, or put into their decision-making process when trying to decide if and when they should engage with ICER. Uh, in terms of the engagement timing? Yes. Yeah, I, so I, I actually believe if you look at the, um, <clears throat> there's this, in our space, there's something called the value flower, which is like, 14 different things that can make up value, cost offsets, quality of life improvements, caregiver burden. They're, they're pretty extensive and there's actually a lot of um, independent organizations that have reviewed that and said that we think it's relatively holistic. Some of those have been very um, um, researched over time and quantified. The cost offset's pretty straightforward. You can do the math, figure out how much standard of care is and, and things like that. 
But there's other areas, caregiver burden, like, yeah, there's productivity impacts, but there's a lot of other things that caregivers face that aren't fully fleshed out. Um, value of hope. Uh, is there, is, can these therapies be bridges? Can they, can they hold someone on until the next great thing comes along? There's all these things that ICER and other, even other HTAs will say, those are great concepts for value, but, they, but they're not quantifying. They talk about them and say, yeah, these are interesting, but they're, they're not actually affecting that price benchmark that they put out in their reports that makes the press. My, I, I would say fight, go and start talking and fight the fight uh, methodologically and say, we believe we can quantify it this way. We, we've done some research with uh, academics and we think you should start considering it and doing it this way. If you know your disease area and you know your product's gonna be unique to some of the, one of those pieces of the value flower, go on and look at it and try to get ICER to think about it. Otherwise, it'll be a great discussion at the day of the public meeting and yeah, well, uh, you're right, this, this could really impact caregivers and then it'll just be, it'll just be, those it'll be words. And you know it's important that the caregivers mention, but actually try to sh try to show that it could actually be quantified that impact that it's having to have someone cured, and that the, that caregiver has so many different aspects of their life that have changed because of that. So that it's not easy to do, but that's what I would. Uh, and the other piece to me would be with ICER is um, look at the standard of care, look at how they're going to think about the clinical endpoints, and if there's anything that's considered more subjective, more along the lines of kind of that not a black and white endpoint put the time in, get the clinicians to speak to them, get them to understand why that endpoint is the way it is and not just assume that they're going to kind of get it right in terms of how they interpret that endpoint. Those are the, the ones that come to my mind. Yeah, that's great advice, thanks. Yep. We, we have time for maybe one question, if the audience has one question. <laughs> yeah, I, I got, yeah, one question for, for Clark before we wrap up. We can't really see hands, so if somebody does, if you can just speak up. All right, if not, that's okay. Thank you for joining the session. We hope you found it of value and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks. Thanks.